So our next speaker is Benedict, Benedict Kirchner, who uh, obtained his PhD at the Technical University in, in Munich, and uh, where he still is. He's now a bioinformatics uh, data, data analyst in the team of uh, Michael Fafel, who's, uh, who's over there. Um, and this he combines with the role of uh, a senior investigator at GeneSearch. And uh, he will tell us, as soon as the slides have arrived, about how RNA distribution and sample handling affects sequencing results. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, thanks for the uh, introduction. And also, uh, thank you for the organizing committee for inviting me to beautiful Florence. So um, basically, today I want to talk about how looking deeper into your small RNA um, sequencing data can make you a happier researcher by getting better results and also by improving your reproducibility. And um, just a quick, I'm doing the same. Did this down? Okay, sorry. Um, so just a quick recap. You might recognize the slide from Michael's talk. What we focus, out in, um, focus on in our lab are two things. The first thing is the biomarker detection, mostly in clinical samples, and we do this also mostly in the small RNA sec um, space, and we do this also in the extracellular space. And the other thing we focus on in our lab is uh, the standardization and the improvement of methods. And today, I'm not going to talk about any specific results that we, any biomarker profiles. Today, I want to talk about how you can improve your results and just, sorry. Um, so what is the, the typical workflow, as Michael has uh, already mentioned? So normally we attract our samples, which can be any type of disease, any type of treatment you want to um, analyze. Then we have a screening cohort, which we normally do um, with small RNA NGS. <clears throat> you get your differentially expressed genes. You try to find your biomarker profile by pathway analysis, by doing functional correlations with your microRNA and the targets. And then later on, we try to um, validate the same in a qPCR experiment because qPCR is still the most um, valid and applicable method that you can have in a clinical setting. So for most patients, you're not going to run a small RNA sequencing experiment, although I would be very happy with it. The reality is that you're going to do qPCR. And also, so when everything works fine and you have a good profile and you have good classification and you have good, um, you have good validation, that's when you will see the results on... Um, um, on conferences like this, but also, if we're going to be honest, a lot of times it's not going to work like this, right? So we have lots of people approaching us with data sets where they basically had some nice findings in the QP, uh, sorry, in the um, NGS part, and then they tried to validate it, and they basically found out that everything is either counter-regulated or is not matching up. And then <clears throat> there's always a big discussion with the people from the NGS saying, ah, oh, we did, or oh, here's the technical validation. You can see the libraries were fine, our sequencing is fine. And then the QPCR people will say, yeah, we followed all the Mikey guidelines and uh, we have our reference genes detected and we did everything correct, but it just does not match up. And while of course it can be that you basically have a biased validation cohort, meaning you have either it's too small or it's also um, just a strange subpopulation that you accidentally picked in your, um, in your screening cohort, a lot of times the answer to who is right is actually both, right? It's just that the, that the data is not matching up is most likely in these cases due to them not really having a look deep enough into the data and trying to find the biases that they need to correct for. So, sorry, that's the wrong direction. <clears throat> so what is most of these bias that I wanted to today talk about for, um, come from? And it's basically the size selection bias in small RNA NGS. So you can imagine if you would just take your RNA, your total RNA, you sequence it, all you would see is ribosomal RNA, it's tRNA, and it's mRNA. Because microRNA is just a small percentage of the total RNA, and you, the, the things you're actually interested in would just get diluted out by everything else. So you do the size selection, meaning you normally um, choose every RNA transcript that is less than 50 nucleotides, could be less than 100, could be less than 200, if you're also uh, interested in the small and long, long coding RNAs. <coughs> and what you actually um, get by this is you get a definitive size selection bias because on the, the flow cell itself in most sequencers, and let's say most of the um, people are sequencing with Illumina, there's a finite number of <coughs> spaces for reads to be detected. Meaning whenever you do a size selection, 
every spot on the flow cell is in direct competition with every other, other bi um, RNA biotype that you have in your sample, right? And <clears throat> one easier solution would be to use spike ends, as Peter mentioned earlier today, the importance of spike ends. But then again, these are still rarely used, at least in the samples or in the experiments that we encounter from our collaborators. And <clears throat> so just to give you a very quick and easy example to, to visualize this, just imagine we have four samples. <clears throat> we have one sample with half the amount of microRNA in it. We have one that has double, and then we have two more that have the same amount of microRNAs, but one is degraded because the sampling was handled um, incorrectly, and the other one has just a genuine um, population of tRNAs in it. And the black ones, that's, these are the sequences that we remove with our size selection. <clears throat> so you can imagine if we remove the black part, and then I make a library with the same amount of reads in each of these four samples, you will have overestimated the first sample, and you will have underestimated the last sample, <clears throat> while um, also underestimating the tRNAs and the degradational products. So this is just a, a um, easy example. Let's see how it actually looks in reality when you have more than just <clears throat> one biotype. So this is a, um, a small study that we did. It's 24 samples. It's divided by six different glioblastoma cell lines. And these cell lines had two different treatments and also had uh, two different isolation methods for um, extracellular vesicles. And what you can immediately see is you have a huge difference in library sizes, right? So normally, when you are not familiar with um, small RNA, NGS, or NGS in, in, in general, you would expect a rather uniform distribution of library sizes. That's not the case. Uh, for most studies, you will have some <coughs> uh, libraries that are where you have basically nothing in it, especially if you work with difficult material like um, EBs, where you have minimum uh, input material. Um, which really hampers the, the library preparation if you don't use a specific kit. <clears throat> and then you have others that just take way more up space on the flow, let, and flow cell that they actually should have. And then <clears throat> the other thing you can see is um, there's not only microRNAs there. The microRNAs are actually a small percentage of it. You will find most of the time you find tRNAs. If you do EV studies, you also, especially from blood, you a lot of times you will uh, find yRNAs. And you also can find um, ribosomal RNAs in anything that is more or less like a degradation product. And the thing is, even if you do your sequencing and afterwards you're only looking for microRNAs, doesn't mean that you do not have these other biotypes in your sample, right? They're still competing for the, um, for the, the spots on the flow cell, and they're still shifting your reads in a direction that you might not be aware of. So <clears throat> then, of course, what we're going to do, we try to normalize samples, right? So we can get rid of this bias. And if you do just a library size normalization, meaning we bring everything on the same height, um, <clears throat> then of course you have a, you introduce a, a new bias if you want like this, because it's by transcript abundance. So if I have some samples with um, lots of reads that are not microRNAs, where we're mostly interested in, they will have a huge impact on the um, normalization. Um, and while others still tend to get underrepresented. But then, of course, we're not doing just a simple library size um, normalization. We go for something that is a little bit more advanced, which is normally like a median, ex, um, <clears throat> median normalization um, on the gene expression metric. So like a, um, the mean gene expression ratio and the median for each sample to use this as a size factor for the correction. But then, of course, you have <coughs> the problem that the abundance of, sorry, not the abundance, the, the number of observations you have for each of your samples is, of course, skewing this uh, normalization because the more observations you make, meaning the more mRNAs, RNAs, and whatever you find has a direct influence on the median, obviously, right? So while it is easy, now my first simple example to see what's the right normalization, in reality, you don't know what the original composition of your sample was, right? That's, that's the original reasoning why you did the sequencing. You want to find out what is the right um, composition. Um, so <clears throat> the influence you can also see uh, in numbers pretty easily. Um, that's most of the people will do either a total transcriptome um, annotation, meaning they get every single biotype. 
and they do the normalization, or they do just the microRNAs, <coughs> meaning they will map, the, they will use the, the mere base reference um, for, for the alignment. And then you see we have samples like the one on the top, where basically none of these inputs would make a difference for the normalization. And then, of course, we had other samples where we greatly increase the reads that we have for our analysis. And we also have samples that we greatly decrease our samples, right? So let's just have a look <clears throat> how this actually then looks when we go forth with our normalization. Um, first of all, you see total recount here means the whole transcriptome. And the microRNA recount, you can immediately see it makes a big difference what you use for your normalization, right? and also how this goes for the um, HCA on top on our, our multivariate analysis to see how our, our samples are clustering. So let's just focus on that. So if we use in this specific example, if we use the total recount, you can see that <coughs> we basically do not have a good clustering. We see for two cell lines at the bottom, there might be a cluster there. They're already doing the same. But if we go for microRNA, we actually have a nice separation for the cell lines. So then obviously you would say, well, I'm interested in the microRNAs anyway. The rest I'm not really interested in. So why I'm just always going for the microRNA. Um, <clears throat> and there's a couple of reasons why you could like expand your normalization process for that. But the other thing we can also have a look at is since the HDA is taking every single gene into account. So this might just be shifts that is generated by the noise. Right, so we have maybe degradational material in our total recount. So the noise is overlaying our actual um, <coughs> variability we have in our data set and um, that is concerning maybe for the treatment. So we can also have a look in the PCA, but there you see more or less the same, the same um, picture, right? So we have no clustering whatsoever if you use the total recount in this case, but we have a very nice clustering for our micro um, recounts only. So, <coughs> That also means by choosing the correct normalization, you can also have the chance to um, find your batch effects. Like in this case, we weren't interested in differences between the cell lines. We were interested in differences between the treatment and the influence the isolation method had on the treatment. So <clears throat> once you identify this, you can go and remove your batch effect and then it looks like this and you can see then obviously cell line is not clustered anymore because that's what we corrected for. Um, and you can see that we get a better cluster for our treatment. We get a better cluster for our isolation, but nothing that you would be really excited to see, right? And that's where actually it comes into play when you're looking at other biotypes as well, not only at, T uh, sorry, at microRNAs or the whole transcriptome, I just said it. You can also look at a combination of them. So in this case, <coughs> we actually had a drastic improvement in classification if we were doing normalization on and also um, differential gene expression on tRNAs and microRNAs combined. And there you see we're already really close to what we wanted to achieve, right? So we have the, we still have a cluster on the left where it's doing a little bit of wonky stuff, but nonetheless, <coughs> we have a way better um, differentiation between um, our treatments. So. Then again, I said in the beginning, um, we're doing a size selection on 50 nucleotides. A tRNA is, a human tRNA is 80 to 90 nucleotides, right? So why should something that is obviously not the right size improve our specificity? And <clears throat> the reason for that is we can have a look if it actually just degradation, if it's a random product, or we can have a look to see if it's actually something that could be specific. And an easy way to do that um, to get an, an indication for that is if you look at the length distribution in your data sets. So here I just chose one of the cell lines at random. You see in black, that's the total length distribution of everything we had in there. You see in blue at the beginning, you see that's our microRNA peak. <clears throat> and then you can see two more peaks. One is the red one for tRNAs, and one is the yellow one for, um, for yRNAs. And the red one, the peak for tRNAs, is pretty specific for 31, 32 nucleotides, right? And then you can go back into the biology. Is this actually something functional? And in this case, yes, it is. So that's also the other part of hidden complexity. It's not only how different biotypes actually affecting your sequencing results. It's also 
what you can see in your data that you just assume, okay, this is a tRNA, I have 49 tRNAs, I'm just going to count up the sums for each of them. But in reality, we actually have <coughs> fragments of tRNA, they're called TRFs. They have also um, proven in the literature to be functional. They have different um, different modes of actions in epigenetic regulation. In also, um, a lot of them are uh, generated during oxidative stress in cell cultures. So that's something that is specifically generated. So it's not a waste. It's not noise. It's not random. So that's something that can be used. And then suddenly, it also makes sense how this improves our normalization method, right? We're not using something that is just specific for this database, right? Uh, for this, for this uh, experiment, we're using something that actually has a biological meaning, <coughs> but we can go even more into detail, and then I'm happy that we also uh, already had an isomere um, talk today. Normally, I'm the only one talking about isomeres. Um, so I can skip most of the isomere stuff. Just a quick reminder. Um, most of the microRNAs you will find in your small RNA sequence ex experiments are actually not canonical microRNAs. A canonical microRNAs is exactly the sequence you find in your database. Most of them, and I've <coughs> tried to um, uh, visualize that on the right, you can see the first one, I've, I've characterized them by what kind of sequence, uh, sequence they would actually map to. The first one is canonical strict, so that has exactly the same sequence and length. The next one would map on a mature microRNA, meaning just by allowing the sequence to be shorter, you already double your output, right? And by allowing a mismatch. Then the next one would be the precursor microRNA, meaning this is, these are the templated additions that still follow the genomic template for the microRNA. You get another 20%. <coughs> and the last one are actually also allowing for additions that are not following the genomic template. So, in this, in this case, for this specific cell lines, but it's the same for the, um, for the others, you get much more information in it, right? Um, and also, this is much more specific information. I just have one small example here. What you can see is one microRNA in our analysis. You see on the top in blue, you see the fold change and uh, the expression of this microRNA if you just count everything up to the canonical part, right? We, we ignore all the isomere variations, we just sum everything up, and then you have a differential gene expression, and you see the fold change is next to nothing, also it's rather nicely expressed. <clears throat> but if you go down into the uh, level of the isomere, you can see that, I'm not sure if you can see or read it, maybe, um, that in one of the cell lines, we rather had the canonical um, microRNA or just a single nucleotide trim, in this case, it was a T that was trimmed, while in the other cell line, we had mostly um, microRNAs that had trimmed two or more nucleotides, right? So what we can also do by going deeper in, into detail um, in our analysis is we can generate better classifications by splitting up something that on the surface doesn't appear to have any difference, while actually it's a, it's a perfect classificator for, in this case, the cell lines. So what happens when we now um, um, expand our analysis, our normalization methods, uh, not just for tRNAs, but for TRS and isomeres? And the following thing happens, right? So now we still have this weird cluster on the left that is doing something that, is, that it shouldn't do, right? But that's, that's the nature of the experiment. Sometimes you have wonky um, samples or something like wrong doing library prep, right? But what we can see is we have a rather nice, um, nice classification of our treatment, and therefore we also have a very nice classification of our um, combination group of treatment in isolation. And that's basically what you want, where you want to end, right? That's <coughs> what you want to see. And then when you do now your differential gene expression, you have a much, much higher chance <coughs> to actually be able to validate in the end because you're not measuring batch effect. You're not measuring the influence of other um, small RNA biotypes on your sequencing, <coughs> and you get closer to the original composition that you actually have in your samples. So just a conclusions in the middle. Um, first of all, I think I can only repeat what Peter said, is the importance of spike ends. Once you have spike ends, you will never run afoul of different 
um, biases caused by site selection because you can actually correct for them, right? You can detect, um, you can go back to what you had in the beginning. If you do not make them, then at least be aware that there is a bias in it and then try to comprehensively analyze your samples, try to characterize the full transcriptome, and then also try to see which combination is actually correct, um, the correct normalization method that you want to use in your experiment. <clears throat> and the, the third point is then that detection of functional fragments and isoforms can actually improve your classification. So once again, we're coming from a biomarker point of view, meaning that we are not overly concerned with the biological function of most of these transcripts. What we are concerned um, with is can I find it? Can I repeatedly find it? And does it classify our um, studies, right? By then you have the chance that you can actually, <clears throat> if you increase it like this, you increase your statistical power by a lot. You just be aware that you can also run afoul of overfitting, um, but there's multiple methods for correction for that. Nonetheless, um, even if you do everything correctly, you can still run into some problems with validation. And that is <clears throat> sometimes also because of the batch effects I mentioned. Batch effect correction in qPCR normally um, um, needs a lot of different um, assays to be run, right? You cannot do batch effect correction just with the five to 10 or 20 microRNAs that you just identified as a, a biomarker profile. <clears throat> and then the other thing that's also a valid way to, I would not say rescue your experiments, but to, um, uh, to rescue the, at least the repro reproducibility is, you have to look for stable reference transcripts in your NGS um, experiments, right? Do not only look for your differentially expressed microRNAs or tRNAs or TRFs, also look for the ones that basically have no expression change, and then you can measure these afterwards and use them for normalization, right? Then it's, it's not necessarily um, a reference gene as you would have it in the Mikey guidelines, meaning that it is stably expressed in your original samples, but it is stable expressed in the analysis that you just did with your NGS, right? And this improves also the, um, the efficiency and the success of your validation. So all in all, this means that <coughs> there's, a, there's a demand for, um, for like looking deeper into your data sets and a lot of these um, workflow pipelines or analysis methods so far are just ignoring it. <clears throat> that's one of the reasons why we did our own, um, uh, our own pipeline, and that's I want to use the last couple of uh, minutes for that. And so our pipeline, we called it Canage, which just stands for Comprehensive Analysis of Small RNA Gene Expression. What you need as input is your raw sequencing data <clears throat> and a complex Study design, the study design can be as complex as you want it to be. This can include any potential batch effect you might think of. This could be um, treatment dates, this could be technicians, <laughs> this could be um, different um, protocols for isolation, right? And we combine both of them. And of course, you have a technical quality control. You still need to know if your sequencing itself um, was fine, if you have high enough FRET scores, meaning you can trust the sequences that come out of it. Then we do alignment. We do not only alignment to um, a single source. We do an alignment basic um, to three sources, which is the tRNAs, the microRNAs, and uh, the rest of the transcriptome, including PE and PRI RNAs. And we even go the step further. As I mentioned, <coughs> we have an, uh, we detect our tRNA fragments. We count the tRNA fragments, and also we count the microRNA isoforms, the isomeres. And after that, you have basically what I call the biological quality control, which is most of the, um, the, the analysis, analysis that I just mentioned, right? So you have a extensive um, output in um, batch effect and outlier removal, right? You can actually see what's the influence of certain aspects in my study design on my data. You can also see for the mapping distributions, you can find maybe RNA biotypes that are of interest to you that you even like hadn't think about in the in the beginning, and then of course <coughs> you can uh, explore the different normalization strategies and their impact on your downstream data. And once you've decided, 
uh, on how you want to normalize data and, and you have removed all your batch effects, then of course we have our classical statistical analysis. You get your differentially expressed genes. You get your supervised um, clustering as well. So if you're looking just for biomarkers, you, um, you also included SPLSDA um, <clears throat> to find like a second approach to biomarkers apart from the differential gene expression. And then of course for microRNAs, you get your pathway analysis of the targets, <coughs> including some um, different steps that would help you to minimize the um, targets for your microRNAs to the actual ones that are expressed in your tissue of interest. And <coughs> this is just another quick overview. This is what I, everything else you can get with it. Um, we try to put as many tools and analysis into it that we found helpful, that we use for our decision making in, anal in, a, in analyzing the data. Um, uh, if you have something else that you find important, you can also write me an email if we, we can still talk about including it. And by this, I want to um, thank, of course, my work group. I want to thank uh, Johannes, who's helping me with um, the pipeline coding and its implementation on clusters. And I <coughs> want to thank our um, collaborators, Marlene and Martina, for um, supplying the data. And for now, we, had, we have to look for a new data host, but it will be online. It's freely available. Um, I would like everyone who's working with small RNAs um, on a NGS data to try it out. Give me some feedback, and hopefully it will help you. Thanks. <laughs>